Well, good morning. Today is our 10th sermon in the book of Philippians. We have titled the sermon series, Journey of a Joyful Life. Last week, we saw the goal of the Christian life is to know Jesus Christ and to be like him. In chapter 3, verse 12 to 16, our portion this morning, Paul shows us how to reach this goal through the process of Christian growth. Please turn with me and stand with me as we read Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 to verse 16. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, But I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So just recently I started to run as a form of exercise. I have never been a good long distance runner. This has been a real chore for me. I don't think I have been made for long distance. I think more of a short distance runner. But when I started running, I I walked and I ran a little bit and I walked and I ran. But I'm, I'm gradually learning to run more than I am to walk. Um, I definitely do not take after my my father. My father is a long-distance runner. He completed 10 Comrades Marathons. Now, the Comrades Marathon is an ultra-marathon, approximately 90 kilometers, which is run annually in South Africa. And in order to qualify to run the Comrades Marathon, you need to complete a standard 42.2-kilometer marathon in under four hours and 50 minutes. Or you have to complete a 56-kilometer ultramarathon in under 6 hours and 45 minutes. Now, I enjoyed watching him run, and I enjoyed celebrating all those runners who work so hard to, to cross the, the finish line. And I remember one year walking up, uh, so waking up early in the morning in Durban and walking with him to the starting line. Uh, at, at the, the, the Durban town center there. It was an upward run from Durban to Peter Maritzburg. And there were thousands of, of runners at the, the starting line. And there was an eager bunch of, of runners who were trying their best to be right in the front of the, 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 the tape. And when the gun went off at the start that morning, uh, those runners in the front, they, they sprinted as fast as as they could, as if they were, were running a 100-meter race, I think probably just to be seen on the, 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 the television. And of course, they sprinted and they sprinted as fast as they could until they ran out of gas and eventually collapsed on the side of the road, um, exhausted. They were also shown on the television, by the way. And they, they forgot that they were running a 90-kilometer ultramarathon. They weren't running a 100 meter sprint. And I've always remembered that image in my mind, you know, especially when it comes to the the Christian life. 
The Christian life, the Christian walk, as it's called, isn't a 100-meter dash. It is a lifelong marathon. And all of us know of individuals who were gloriously saved, but after a few months or a few years, they, they grew cold spiritually, and they fell into some complacency or even into some sin when it came to spiritual matters. And we all need the mentality of a long-distance runner if we're going to run to the end, if we're going to pursue right to the, the very end. A person may start the Christian life with enthusiasm. He may have zeal and he may have vigor. And then after a few years, fall into a life of, of indifference or, or apathy or even inactivity, a nominalism. And you may have been a Christian for a long time already, but you can't start thinking, I don't need to grow anymore, and then stop running. Now, long-distance runners have to complete the entire course. They can't decide after a few miles that they've run far enough and give up and just lay on the side of the road. You, you don't get a medal for that. And the Apostle Paul had to deal with this attitude that had unfortunately crept into the Corinthian, sorry, the, the, the Philippian church here because of the false teaching of the, the Judaizers. And some of the Philippians who were influenced by these false teachers were saying that to be a, a Christian, one only had to believe in Christ. But to be a spiritual Christian, one had to keep the, the ceremonial laws and the traditions of Judaism. Now this cause problems, as we will see. I think it's important we understand that these legalistic Jews taught this and how it worked out in, practical, in their practical lifestyle. They taught a, a system of man-made laws, man-made rituals that weren't part of the Bible. Customs and traditions that were distinctly Jewish but, but not biblical. And for them, if a person was circumcised, if a person obeyed the ceremonial law, if he kept the traditions of Judaism, then the person was spiritual. In fact, that person was truly mature. He was considered truly mature. He had reached the, the zenith. He had reached the apex of their legalistic system. He had arrived. He had a, achieved everything which was dictated and which was mandated by their own system of righteousness. It was all done. He could not go any further. And the problem was, even though this was a human effort, the result was they became very proud. They became very complacent with their, with their efforts at being spiritual. And for all practical purposes, they thought they had reached some state of sinless perfectionism because they did or did not do certain things. And there was no real relationship with God. Their focus and their energy was just about the, the rules and the rituals and the traditions, which created a, a coldness in their heart when it came to God Himself. And Paul addresses this in this chapter. And my first point this morning we see in verse 12 and we see Paul's resolve here. Look at verse 12 in the first part there. Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. And what Paul is speaking about here is this false teaching of perfectionism. He is, he's really attacking these Judaizers, their false teaching. For Paul, there is no such thing as a perfect Christian or perfectionism, which, which unfortunately they taught. At no time are Christians sinlessly perfect or have their sin natures totally eradicated. Not in this lifetime, okay? And notice the word this that Paul uses in that sentence there. And that word this is referring back to the, the previous section in which he wrote that he wanted to gain Christ. Remember in verse 8 and in verse 10? Last week, he wanted to know Christ. So he's referring to that. He's referring to that. Paul's one consuming goal was to know God, was to know Christ. And this is why Paul says that he has not already obtained this. 
He's saying that he is not perfect. He wants to be. He wants to attain this, but he has not arrived. And Paul's, Paul knows that this will only happen when, when he beholds Jesus face to face. It's not going to happen on this earth. It's going to happen when he's in glory with his Savior. But nevertheless, Paul's resolve is to know Jesus better. He looks forward to the day where he will be perfect. He looks forward to the day where he will behold Jesus face to face. He has a holy desire for what he does not have. And Paul knows he is not perfect. And right here, what he's doing, he's confessing that. He's confessing that to the Philippian church. And this teaching was completely opposite to what the, the Judaizers were teaching about the legal system of perfection. And the word perfect there is used means fully complete, or it means mature. And Paul says that he falls short of being fully complete. He falls short of the mature fellowship with Christ, because even as an unsaved man, he still has sin in his life. He recognizes that. He recognizes the struggle with sin. He recognizes and confesses his fear and, and his doubt was not completely over with. Of course, he had, he had made progress in his battle against sin. He had made great pains in his spiritual life to be Christ-like. He's not saying that he's not striving for this. But the goal was still before him. And he was striving towards it. The goal wasn't behind him. That's what he's saying here. He hasn't achieved perfection. He is striving to be more like Christ. And then he says, in verse 12, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. These are wonderful words here. And I think this is the whole point and the, really the whole motivation behind what, what Paul is saying to all of us this morning. And these words, made his own, have also been translated as, as apprehended or, or seized. Christ has seized me. Christ has apprehended me. And I, the picture here, I think what Paul is talking about is his, is his experience, his salvation experience on the Damascus Road, remember? Where, where Jesus seized Paul for himself, where Jesus made Paul a believer. Remember, he was a murderer going out to kill Christians, and, and he was seized by God, and he was changed completely. And he was turned from a, a murderer into a, into a missionary. Jesus made Paul his own. We know before his conversion, Paul was proud. He was a relig religious zealot. He was self-righteous, just like these Judaizers. And he cared nothing about Christ. And Paul was not about to change until he met Christ. Or better yet, Christ met him and Christ seized him. He could not change. He didn't have any ability to change until Christ made that change in him. Christ sovereignly intervened into his life. He was lost, even though he was religiously zealous. He was a lost man. And the starting point in his salvation was when Christ laid hold of him for salvation. And Paul laid hold of Christ for faith. Paul hold, laid hold of Christ by faith. And yet, Christ laid hold of him for a purpose. And Paul talks about that in Romans 8, that he may be more like Christ. The whole purpose of his salvation, he understood, was to be more like Christ. Not to live a, a nominal Christian cultural life where, where you just cruise and there's no effect and change in your life. Paul understood the purpose, to be like Christ. And Paul pressed on in his life to be more conformed to the image of Christ. He found Christ, but now he wants to expand and deepen his relationship with Christ. He wants to experience more and more of Christ. If you're a Christian, the truth, this is true for you as well. When you were saved, Jesus seized you and he made you his own. You had no power to change in your own effort. 
Jesus seized you and turned you from sin, from darkness, and brought you into his marvelous light. He made you his own for a purpose. Not just so you can continue in your sin. Not so that you just can continue a nominal cultural Christian life. But so that you can live for Christ. So that you can be conformed to the image of Christ. So that you can be more like Christ. This question this morning, is your resolve then to seize Jesus? Is your resolve to seize Jesus? Do you pursue Him to make Him your own? Do you read His Word often? Do you speak to Him in prayer often? Do you serve Him faithfully in whatever situation you find yourself? Do you long to see Jesus? Our second point this morning, we see in verse 13 and verse 14, Paul's pursuit. Paul's pursuit. Look at verse 13 13 here. Paul reiterates what he has been saying in the previous verse. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. Paul is very conscious that he has not yet arrived. And he's saying it again. He is not yet perfect. Definitely, certainly, he's not denying that he is a new creation in Christ, but he does not yet see Christ face to face. And so he continues in verse 13. Look there. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Again, we see Paul's single-mindedness here, his his focused mind here. He says, but one thing I do. Paul was clearly involved in all kinds of ministry. We know about that. We know he was a, a preacher. We know that he was a gifted teacher. We know that he was even an author. He he wrote many books, he wrote many letters. We know that he was a, a, a very gifted evangelist. We know that he was a counselor. But all of these roles, all of these functions flow out of his one supreme ambition. He says there, but one thing I do. But one thing I do. And Paul's image here is is that of a of a race, of a of a foot race. And he compares the the track runner who is you know well trained and disciplined to the Christian who is to persevere in Christ. The key focus to a successful runner is concentration, right? Everything is put out of the runner's mind except except winning the race. I read an illustration of this this week. On the 7th of August in 1954, during the British Empire Games in Canada, what was called the Miracle Mile, So up until that time, it was the greatest mile run matchup that ever took took place. So Britain's Roger Bannister and Australian John Landy were the only two sub-four-minute milers in the world. So Bannister had been made, sorry, Bannister had been the first man ever to run a four-minute mile. And both runners were in peak condition. And Roger Bannister strategized that he would relax during the third lap and he would save everything for his finishing drive. But as they began that third lap, the Australian poured it on, stretching his already substantial lead. And immediately Bannister adjusted his strategy, increasing his pace and gaining on Landy. And the lead was quickly cut in half and at the bell for the final lap they were even. And Landy, he began running faster, and Bannister followed suit, and both men were flying. Bannister felt he was going to lose if Landy did not slow down. And then came the famous moment, which has been replayed thousands of times in print and flickering black and white um, screens, as at the, the last stride before the home stretch, the crowds were cheering, and Landy could not hear Bannister's footsteps behind him, and he looked back 
which was a fatal lapse of concentration. And Bannister launched his attack just as he was looking back. And he won the Empire Games that day by, by five yards. And John Landy's mistake was that he, he looked to see what was behind him. He looked to see what was lying behind him. And at that cost, and because of that, that cost him the race. Just that momentary glance was enough of a loss of focus and a loss of concentration to, to slow him down. A runner does not look back. If he does, he will lose his speed. He will cut down his stride, which in turn may cause him to lose the race, as it did. And Paul says in verse 13b, look there, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. And Paul forgot completely about the, the sins of his unsaved life, but he also forgot about the victories of his previous achievements, of what he could become quite relaxed about and quite proud about. And there were many things. Paul called himself the chief of sinners, we know that. He had lots of guilt that he had to overcome when it came to murdering the church. But he also had many victories when it came to planting churches, didn't he? He was a very gifted man. But he laid all of that behind him so that he could strain forward to what lies ahead. There was no complacency when it came to the Apostle Paul. He attempted to erase negative things from his mind because he knew that he was forgiven by Christ. He refused to let the sins of his past haunt him and distract him and keep him from running the race that he needed to, using his life to make a difference for the glory of God. He knew that Christ had died for his sins, no matter how great or how small, and he laid hold of that. Paul refused to go over and over his shortcomings as a Christian. And I'm sure he put behind him all his failures and mistakes as a saved person as well. A Christian must never go back, but needs to go forward if he is to win the race. And the question we need to ask ourselves, what is keeping you from going forward this morning? What are you looking back at that is keeping you from losing your focus? Paul forgot his failures but also his successes, also his victories that he could become very complacent about. A Judaizer with this legalistic system felt that they had arrived at perfection and they didn't need to do anything else. And he could sit back on his laurels and he could become indifferent, he could become proud about his achievements and about the future and he could become very useless really when it came to his present situation. Really good for nothing. But this was not the case with Paul. And this is what he was trying to encourage the church here in Philippians, not to fall into this false teaching, this trap. He would, Paul would not rest on his laurels. He would not live in the past. He was determined to move forward. And he says at the end of verse 13, straining toward what is ahead. He clearly understands that the race is not one until he crosses the finish line. The Christian must grasp every opportunity for fellowship with Christ until the race is finished. There must be unwavering progression in the things of Christ. You know, for some people, coming to Abu Dhabi is just like a stopgap. It's just like a place where they come to make some money for a while and then they're going back to their country where they will continue their lives. Here is just a, really a stopgap. And the problem with that type of thinking is that you come here and you can just stop. Stop your relationship with the Lord. Stop your relationship with other Christians. And you can just become complacent in where you are spiritually because your life is somewhere else. We need to be careful of that way of thinking. We need to be looking at progressing when it comes to the things of Christ. And church is important for that, towards that end. Developing relationships with other believers is important towards that end to help us to grow in our 
walk with the Lord, to help us to become more closer to the Lord. Coming to prayer meetings is important towards that end. Being part of home groups is important if we want to progress in the things of Christ. Look at verse 14. He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul was constantly pursuing the goal of Christ-likeness as a disciplined athlete of Jesus Christ. Now let's remember where he is at this time. He's in jail. I mean, of everybody, he could say, okay, let me just relax now, okay? I'm in jail. There's not much I can do here. I mean, what, what good can I do to others, and how can I minister to others? I'm in jail. Just let me sit back and relax and feel sorry for myself. He's writing a letter to the Philippians not to feel sorry for themselves, not just to sit on their laurels and to think that they can just coast. He's telling them, move forward. Press on towards the goal of total and complete fellowship with Christ. Even though he knew he could never attain this in his life, he was, he was not going to waste his life. Fellowship with Christ is progressive. We spoke about that last week. The relationship you have with your, your spouse is progressive. If you have the same relationship with your wife as you did when you first got married, there's a problem, isn't there? You haven't invested in that relationship, have you? You haven't taken out your wife or, or your husband for, for dinner. You've never taken him out for a walk. You've never prayed with him. You've never read the Bible with him. You've never gone through problems with him. You've never solved issues with him. There's a problem, isn't there? There's no progression. You haven't gone through trials together. There hasn't been any victories together. Fellowship with Christ is progressive. Each step of deeper fellowship with Christ is a step towards heaven. It's a step towards the complete reality of Christ. Christ is going to be in heaven, folks. Remember, we spoke about that last week. Heaven is not a place where we're going to just enjoy the food or sing Kumbaya for the rest of our lives. Heaven is where we're going to worship Jesus forever. Are you looking forward to that? The complete reality of being with Christ. Each step of fellowship with Christ now is a little bit of heaven. And Paul's pursuit of seeing Jesus face to face in glory. Is that our pursuit? Is that your pursuit? Are you pursuing that as a couple, as a family? Pursuing Jesus face to face in glory. Look at verse 15 and verse 16. Here we see Paul's advice as he comes to the end of the section. And of course, the advice is straining towards this goal. Look at verse 15. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Verse 16. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. And Paul is writing against these false teachers. Remember the context. And they believed that it was possible to attain perfection in this life. Paul does not believe that. Mature Christians know that they are still on a journey toward where they will behold the glory of God and where they will enjoy perfect and sinless communion with Him one day when we're in heaven. But there is no quick and easy, instantaneous way to get in top physical condition without practice, without discipline, without some pain. You have to work at it every day. I don't enjoy running. Can I just say that? <laughs> but there has to be discipline in order to, to, to reach the goal, right? You have to work at it. And the day you stop is, is the day that you start going downhill. And the Greek word translated to think here or to be, to be minded of there in verse 15 is, is also translated as have this attitude. Have this attitude. And it's used 10 times in Philippians. 
And since the theme of Philippians is joy, I think there's a, there's a correlation here between the attitudes that we have and the joy that we, that we get to enjoy. The attitude affects our joy. The two strands of Paul's attitude come through in these verses. He views Christian growth as a, as a process, as a lifelong process. And so he has a long-haul attitude, a long-haul attitude. And he views Christian growth as the kind of thing where you can never say, well, I've arrived, so you have to keep moving forward. The minute we say we've arrived, the minute we say we have nothing else that we can learn, there's a problem. The minute we say there's nothing else that the church has to offer me, we have a problem. The minute we say I don't need to go to home groups because I know everything, there's a problem. The minute we say I don't need to join prayer groups because I'm totally okay, there's a problem. And any athlete will tell you that that attitude is often the difference between victory and defeat. A team that lacks in, in raw talent can sometimes defeat a team with much more ability because they have the right attitude going into the game. They have more determination. An attitude is crucial in the spiritual life as well. And remember, even Paul admits that after 30 years of striving, he still hasn't arrived. He still wants to arrive. He still wants to achieve. He's determined. And we need to be patient with, with each other. We need to be patient with ourselves. You know, we can bear with one another and we can be gracious to those who are, who are struggling with problems even after many years of, of being Christians. And the analogy of how we grow as humans is, I think, helpful and applicable to us as children of God. It takes years for children to grow to maturity you don't expect more of them than they are capable of at, at certain stages in their, in their lives. For those of you who have children, you know, you expect babies to, to dirty their diapers and, and to burp in your face and to cry in the middle of the night. You expect that at a certain age. But if they're wearing diapers when they're 14 years old, there's a problem, right? There's certain stages. And during those stages, you are patient with them. You know, if a brother or sister is growing, we need to be patient. We need to be gracious. We need to be realizing that, that there's a process involved. There's a lifelong process. And we really need this attitude, this, this long-haul attitude. Spiritually, the important thing to ask ourselves is, am I actively involved in this process? Am I actively involved in growing is there growth in my life? A year from today, can you see growth in your life? And Paul adds verse 16, so that no one will mistake him to mean that you can just kick back and, and not do anything, not work at growing. Look at verse 16. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. And he means that wherever you're, you're at, you need to keep living in obedience to the light that God has given you, to the light that God has shown you, and keep seeking Him for more light, and keep growing in your love for Him. If God has dealt with some sin in your life, don't slip back, and don't continue in it. If God has given you victory over it, pursue Christ and advance in your relationship with Him. Progress. If He has cleaned out a dirty closet of your life, you don't start throwing junk back in that closet again. My children have just recently been cleaning out their rooms, and there's a lot of junk in their closets, I can tell you. And I keep on telling them, don't put junk back in the closet, just leave it out. If you want to grow in the Lord, it's essential that you maintain a teachable heart. The teachable heart is humble because it admits, I may be wrong or I may be lacking in understanding. I may need to repent and I may need to change. A 
teachable heart is submissive, ready to respond to new light that God gives from His Word, is teachable. A person with a teachable heart is not a, a know-it-all, refusing to learn from other Christians. With that kind of teachable heart, we need to keep moving in the present. Remembering that progress is important. Let us press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let's not become complacent in our walk with the Lord. I know summer is a difficult time because a lot of people are away and our schedules are a little bit out of whack. But let's not be lazy in our walk with the Lord. Let's be praying. Let's be reading our Bibles. Let's be coming alongside each other and encouraging each other. And then when home groups start again, let's, let's be motivated to run the race together. Encourage each other in our race towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I want to finish with a, a running illustration I thought that would be appropriate today. Many of you know Eric Little, you may have heard of that name, famous, uh, made famous by the movie Chariots of Fire. And Chariots of Fire was declared one of the top 100 movies you have to watch before you die, okay? So if you've never watched Chariots of Fire, please go home and watch that today. Eric Little, he was known as the, the Flying Scotsman. And he was chosen to run in the 1924 Summer Olympics in Paris. And he refused to run on a Sunday because he was a believer. He wanted to give honor to the Lord on the Lord's Day. And he refused to run on a Sunday. He made a stand, a very radical stand. And so he did not compete in his, in his best event. But he did compete in the 200 and the 400 meter race, which was run on a different day. And Eric Lill hadn't trained for those events. And nobody knew him in those events, his competitors. So the outcome was unsure. But Eric Little won a bronze medal in the 200-meter race. And then he stunned the world by winning the 400-meter race in a new world record. So I've spo I spoiled the story for you already, okay? <laughs> but nonetheless, go and watch it. It's amazing. He broke the 400-meter record. And after the Olympics, though, he didn't stop there as a Christian as he, in his stand for, for Christ. Little completed his studies, and then he went to serve as a missionary in China with the China Inland Mission. And in 1932, he married Florence McKenzie, and in 1941, because of the war, he, he sent his wife and three daughters to Canada while he continued to minister there in China during the war. And in 1943, he was taken as a prisoner and put into a Japanese internment camp. And he continued to minister to the children that were there around him. And he was given the nickname Uncle Eric, the students called him, because he served Christ faithfully in very difficult circumstances. And sadly, however, in 1945, at the age of 43, Eric Little died of a, of a brain tumor. And he was buried in this internment camp in a grave marked with a wooden cross. And he was eventually interred in the, in the mausoleum of martyrs in, in China. But in a sense, Eric Little died running the race. Faithfully. He epitomized the truth of, of Paul's teaching here in Philippians 3. He didn't sit on his laurels and think now that he had arrived, he could do whatever he wanted to or do nothing at all. He continued faithfully serving. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, Eric Little pressed on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of Jesus Christ. He ran his race well to the very end. What will be said of you when you stand before the Lord on that day? Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have run the race well. May that be true 
of every single one of us. Let's pray. Father, as we come to the table this morning, we ask, Lord, that you would examine our hearts. We pray, please, Lord, may we be honest with you today. Lord, if we have not been running the race faithfully, we pray that you would forgive us. Lord, we want our lives to count for your glory. We want to be fulfilling the very purpose for which you have saved us. And thank you, Lord, for all the blessings that you've given us to help us towards that end. Thank you, Lord, for the grace of New Life Church to be part of this church, to help us towards that end. Forgive us, Lord, where we have taken these opportunities for granted. Forgive us, Lord, where we have fallen into this trap of thinking that we have arrived, that we have nothing else to learn, that we have nothing else to do, and we are just coasting and becoming really cold in our walk with you. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. And help us, Lord, as we take these elements, once again, to remember the gospel that has saved us from our sins, so that we can have a relationship with you. Forgive us, Lord, where we have fallen short. Help us today, Lord, once again, to move forward, to strive towards that goal that you have given us, Lord, until we see you face to face. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.